second closing speed on airplanes that are out there. If you need to take evasive action, you need to be able to understand how to do it quickly, right? When we're talking about classrooms, when, you know, obviously we don't have to worry too much about our classroom slamming into the side of a mountain, but we do have to worry about making sure that our faculty can do the things that they need to do quickly and easily in the classrooms. And obviously, we need to make those classrooms also repairable so that if our technician gets a call we, and there's an emergency, we're wasting 300 people's time in a lecture hall, that needs to be something that's simple enough for us to use to repair and maintain. The more they overthink the plumbing, the easier it is to stop up the drain. Who remembers where that quote came from? Thank you. <laughs> that was words from Scotty after he had sabotaged the Excelsior, which was a excessively complex starship. Um, and the idea there w was if whatever it is is too complex, it's going to be too easy to break or too easy to sabotage. Hopefully, we don't have too much problem with sabotage in our classrooms. When I was doing this research, one of the things that I happened to find on the internet was this logo for the Joint Strike Fighter program. And I don't really know the context of, of that logo, but I found the four words on the bottom interesting. I suspect the logo was probably used to sort of emblem the program when they were trying to sell the program to the government, to Congress, or whatever. But the four words at the bottom, lethal and survivable, that's about what, what is this product, what is this thing supposed to do? What a fighter aircraft is supposed to kill the enemy and protect the pilot. That's about all it's supposed to do, right? Our classrooms are supposed to support teaching and support learning in the rooms. That's what they do. And oh, by the way, they're supposed to be supportable and affordable. Those are issues that whether you're designing a fighter plane or you're designing a classroom that we have to deal with. We have to make sure that our facilities can be supported and that we can afford them. So the question that I have to ask is, can the KISS principle survive in the digital age, the digital classroom? I don't know, but we're here to think about it and talk about it a little bit today. So back in the day, when we had analog in the classroom, we still have analog in most of our classrooms. We had composite video to deal with. We had RGB VGA video to deal with. Um, Rick, one of our, uh, our classroom coordinator, always used to say to me, I can run composite video over an untwisted uh, uh, clothes hanger. Um, composite video is pretty easy to deal with. Might not look great. Same with RGB VGA, right? You have a cable, it might not look great at the other end, but you can make it work. Um, VGA was relatively simple for us to deal with, and after dealing with it for 15 or so years, we all got pretty good at making sure that our classrooms dealt with, with the analog technology um, in a pretty reasonable way. So then came along digital. How many of you in your shops have some regular mantra that you say, boy, I wish we were back in the analog days. This would be easier to deal with. Does this, I'm not the only one, right? This comes up, because now we have to deal with all of this new stuff. We have, not only is it analog versus digital, do our users have analog or digital devices, but we've got to have, we've got different kinds of formats and protocols and, and aspect ratios and resolutions and, and, and copy protection. Boy, isn't that fun. Um, and new things coming along all the time. So this digital stuff is making our lives awfully complicated. Not only is it making our lives complicated, but it's making our podiums complicated. And what we have to think about is how do we maintain as simple an environment for the users and as simple an environment for our technicians as we can maintain. So what I try to do here is start thinking about some principles that we can think about to guide our, our, our thoughts about classroom design in this digital era. First one I came up with was address needs, not whims. How many of you have had random faculty member come into your office or, or to your helpline and say, I have this 
really, really interesting situation. I want to be able to do this and that and the other thing and this crazy thing that you've never even uh, conceived of before. How, how many of you have had that situation? So we have to deal with this, right? We don't want to be no people. We don't want to say, no, I'm sorry, you can't do that, go away. Because um, that's not our job. And you guys know the whole idea behind classroom support, audiovisual support. We're here to help people do what they need to do. Um, and within that, we have to maintain some semblance of order about the kinds of things that we can solve. So when we have those situations, I try to go back and say, okay, think about what this user's problem really is and come up with solutions for them based on technologies or, or solutions that would actually work. Um, uh, and it might cause them to have to change a little bit about what they're thinking, but if you give them a blank slate, you're going to be chasing endlessly around trying to find, to, to deal with, with it basically hopelessly complex needs uh, because it, you know, if depending on the size of your school, you may have hundreds or thousands of faculty members with hundreds or thousands of different things that they need to deal with, um, and there's just no way that we can keep up with that. Second one, know thy customer. Understand what it is that they need to do. Um, we've had a new, uh, I, I work for the CIO at the University of Florida, and um, we've, we've had a new CIO in the last couple of years, and one of the things when I explain what it is that we do in classroom support, why is the work that we do not done by a standard IT help desk? Why is it not done by a physical plant uh, facilities group that, that maintains uh, carpet and paint? Why is it that we're involved in classroom design? It's because we understand the pedagogies, the needs of the users in the classroom. We understand the teaching and learning implications of everything from the acoustics in the room to how the light works. How many of you have dealt with an architect that, will des that designed a really, really beautiful room for you that just didn't work? That's why we have to be involved in that process and so that we really understand what our customers need. Here's an example. This is a screw up that I made. This is a lecture hall that we have that we just updated this summer. And it used to have a screen in the middle, an offset single screen, sorry, I keep saying screen, um, and a single XGA projector that wasn't bright enough, and it blocked the chalkboard. So I was talking to some faculty in that room about how could we make this room better. We got the idea that we could set up these two uh, projectors uh, ang angled at the angled walls. Um, they're a little bit smaller than I wanted, but we were constrained by the little fire alarms that are, that are on the sides there. So, but, but as far as I could tell, looking at that room, it was great. Uh, not a bad seat in the house. Uh, you could see everything on both screens. We had full HD on both of the images, um, and it looked great. What I didn't know was that there's a bunch of organic faculty, organic chemistry faculty. All faculty are organic, right? Um, <laughs> well, that's another presentation. Anyway. so. Organic chemistry faculty. What I didn't realize was the way some of them taught in that room was that those courses they were teaching was about taking three-dimensional molecular structures and understanding how that is projected on a flat surface, whether it be a textbook or a computer screen or a projection screen. So what I didn't realize is we had faculty in there that had these big elaborate wooden tinker toy-like um, mo molecule models that they were holding up in front of that central projection screen and talking to the students about how these three-dimensional models were projected on the flat surface. I didn't know that. I didn't have that conversation. So the faculty walked in first day of fall semester and said, where the heck did my screen go? And I said, well, look, you've got two screens now. They're better than they were before. But wait, I can't do what I was doing. I can't do what I needed to do. Um, so you know, that's a classic example, know the customer, know their pedagogies, know what they need to do, and figure out what you can do to solve it. Now what we're gonna do to solve it is install a third projector in the middle, so yeah, that probably didn't make my life more simple, but it is what it is. So the next one was address solutions systematically. Um, we all have some number of classrooms greater than one. 
Uh, at UF, we have about 250. If they were all different, our technicians would never be able to keep up with that, with those complexities. That different would never, those differences, they would never be able to solve the problems uh, in either a cost-effective or a time-efficient manner uh, for the users. Um, so addressing the problem systematically, thinking about a systems viewpoint, if I change this, how does it change that, uh, is, is really important <clears throat> when we're putting our classrooms together. A fourth one, cultivate relationships. Relationships, obviously, with your faculty so that they can, you can understand what their needs are, what their technologies are. Relationships with your IT support, your networking support. Um, how many times have you all, uh, how many of you have had issues with a networking support group that wants to make your life complicated by doing something to the network that made what you think should be a simple thing very complex? We've all had that experience, right? Um, so working with those folks on a regular basis so that they can understand your problems and your users' problems and how they are different from the average staff member's office support, the jack in their office is a different networking thing. Um, so making sure that you have close relationships with those folks, folks in your facilities uh, and physical plant, um, as far as you know, changing light bulbs and all those kinds of things, making sure that they understand Sometimes it's easy for all of us to get into the habit of thinking of the things that we have to deal with, whether it's changing light bulbs in a classroom or whatever, uh, as you know, being just a day-to-day -day task that we have to do and forgetting about the people and the processes that, are, that we're actually there to support. So those are four principles that I thought of. And note that these are not strategies. We'll talk about those in a minute. What other principles, thinking about these kinds of things, and Bill, um, have you guys uh, thinking about this? What, what other principles can you, you guys think of that might be useful uh, to, to think about with, with our classrooms? Raise your hand and Bill, Bill will repeat whatever you say. I know some of Not you anything. probably think of some. Total cost of ownership. So manage, thinking about what not only solving today's problem with whatever the best solution is, but thinking about over the lifespan of that installation, what's it going to cost in terms of support, repair, um, gray hair, all of that. <laughs> Right. So, um, so again, thinking about what what are the uh, what are the uh, say say that again. Right. Right. So being able to manage those expectations. And you know, again, going back to the relationships thing, you know, when faculty come to me and say, you know, I'd like to do X, and I say, well, you know, if we did X, then that would solve your problem, but all of your colleagues would then have this other problem. If you take the time to explain that, everybody is usually, okay, I understand, uh, I understand why we can't do that, um, but you know, we certainly all want to be in the business of helping people solve their problems and not saying. You know, no, you can't do that because you'll break the network if you do, or that kind of thing. Other principles that you guys can think of. Yes. <laughs> All right, point taken, point taken. <laughs> So repeating that for the recording, um, <laughs> and hopefully we didn't get his face on video, um, the, uh, it's important, uh, well, we have to recognize that sometimes people really don't care um, uh, as much as they should about the impact of their actions on others. Um, you probably only have to go out and drive your car on the strip for a little while to, to understand that reality. 
Um, but that is something that, that's a, it's an excellent point. Other principles? Okay. So these are the kinds of things that we're thinking about when we're thinking about what kinds of technology we're going to install, how we're going to support it, how we're going to design it for our rooms. So now let's talk a little bit about strategies. Um, this gets a little bit closer to the nuts and bolts, but, but certainly not quite into the details yet. We talked a little bit before about standardization. Standardization, I think, is key. Um, I've always said that if faculty, at least at our institution, faculty don't usually get to predict what classroom that they're going to be in. Some do, depending on their program, but for the most part, they get stuck wherever they get stuck in a classroom. They cannot uh, adapt their pedagogies, their instructional strategies to a particular technology if they can't trust that it's going to be in the room that they're going to be in next semester. If you're going to ask a faculty member to say, okay, I've just got this grand new document camera here that you can use and so that you can abandon your old chalkboard and, and overhead projector technology, um, and so they say, okay, that's great, and then they spend 80 hours redoing how they're teaching to match that technology, and then you tell them the next semester that, oh, I'm sorry, the room that you're in doesn't have that. Well, that doesn't fly. Um, so we have to make sure that the technologies that we put out there are ubiquitous enough that the faculty can, can reasonably expect that they'll be able to, to have that technology available wherever they're at. Now that does not mean that we can't do R&D rooms, we can't do pilot projects, all of that type of thing, but we have to be clear uh, about that technology or those methodologies, whatever they are, that those are special, it's a pilot project, and that we don't, bring, we don't create surprises for people um, when they go to rooms that they didn't expect. Um, and I thought, since I didn't talk too much about what our particular technology is, I thought I would mention that this is our new standard uh, podium design for our classrooms. Um, it's actually two middle Atlantic racks that are bolted together with a custom countertop from a local cabinet shop bolted to the top of it. Um, and it has basically everything that we need uh, in that solution. Um, there's obviously, there's probably 20, 30 different podium vendors that you can come up with uh, that do basically the same thing. This saved us a few bucks. Um, but what we've tried to do is make sure as we're transitioning from our old design, which those of you that were in Gainesville in 2007 remember our little gray carpeted podiums, um, our old design transitioning to this new design, which is much more modern looking, looks much more like what most of you have in your classrooms. Um, it's something that's I think a lot more um, I don't know that it's better or not, but it's going to be standard so that when they go in the rooms, they know uh, what they need to do and where it is. Practice intuitive design. Um, I get a little bit in trouble sometimes for saying, you know, think like Apple. Um, Apple has made all of their money and has made them into the most valuable, made their company into the most valuable company in the world by thinking about intuitive product design. Does that mean we need to love them for everything? No. Um, but intuitive design makes everyone's life simpler. Uh, this is our projector control interface. Um, it's a dumb uh, keypad uh, that talks to our Crestron D DMPS 300s. Um, the design and layout of those buttons is essentially exactly the same as was on our Zantac IR keypads that we've been using since 1998 or so. Um, and so we've not changed the interface on folks. Um, but it's still, now we've added, you know, lighted control, a little bit of status feedback. You guys probably all did that in your classrooms a long time ago. Um, but it's pretty nice to be able to know whether the system thinks the projector's on or off, right? So we have a light now, that's cool. Four input selects, a mute, and volume control. That's what I feel is the basic minimum necessity for control in the classroom. Certainly there's a lot of other approaches, but that's what we're doing for all of our classrooms. 
in the rooms like the one I showed you a minute ago that has two projectors or even three. We're just stacking these next to each other with arrows so they can see projector left, projector right. And it doesn't matter whether it's projector right or projector right because there's an arrow. Um, think like Ikea. That's another. If you put together Ikea furniture, the it's all little line drawings that's designed so that no matter what language you speak or what continent you live on, you can figure out how to put this together. And you can also mutter about how you didn't have the one last little piece of hardware that you needed to complete your project. Think about iteration and new needs from the start. Um, how many of you feel like you did your design for your classrooms and then you're never going to have to change it again? No, probably none of us. Um, so making sure that we're thinking about the fact that we're going to have to keep changing. That old podium that I talked about that we had in our classroom, I think we counted that we've done seven different revisions of that over time. Uh, it's basically the same design, but we've changed dimensions and things as we went from laptops to big desktops to smaller desktops to VCRs to combo players, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we know we're going to need to change things and making sure that our designs are going to accommodate those changes um, in, a, in a reasonably easy way. Number four, people watch. Not meant to be creepy, right? Um, but if you spend some time in your classroom watching how people use the technology, um, it's, I find it really, really helpful. Uh, sometimes uh, toward the beginning of the semester, I'll go around some different classrooms. I'll just walk in at the end of class and introduce myself. I'm Mark McAllister from Classroom Support. I was just wondering how things went, shake their hand, and, and usually they're a little bit mystified that somebody would actually come to a classroom and ask them how it went. Um, but it gets you some good feedback. But just sitting in the back of the classroom and watching how peop what people do, how they do it, you know, if, if you can see them up there and they're like, <laughs> might be time to go back and look at your control design, see what it is is confusing the user. Simplify schematic and physical design as much as you can. Obviously, I listed that whole big long list of issues that we have to deal with. That means that probably not just one cable uh, and plugging straight into the projector is going to get you what you want anymore. Um, this is a schematic design for our most complicated classroom um, that includes lecture capture in it. I look at that and all those colored lines and I say, wow, that's a lot of connections. Um, we need to go back <clears throat> regularly and look at our designs, both you know, physically, how are they laid out in the classrooms, and also schematically, and think about are there ways that we can simplify this and still do what it is what we need to do in the classrooms? Are there pieces that we can eliminate? That DVD, VCR combo, do we still need it? Are we going to need it? When can we get rid of that? Um, you know, obviously, we don't want our technical needs on the schematic to dictate what our users get. We need the users and their needs to dictate what's in there. But at the same time, we need to constantly evaluate, make sure that we're we're solving those needs in the most simple and elegant way that we can. And I think managed choice goes back to standardization uh, and some of the other things that we were talking about, making sure that, <clears throat> you know, obviously, <clears throat> excuse me, we have to provide options because not every faculty member that walks in the classroom is going to teach the same way, right? But like we were talking about before, we want to make sure that we're not providing every single possible choice that they could get um, and making it excessively complex for them. A uh, good example of that, um, how many of you have video conferencing units integrated into some of your facilities? So video conferencing adds a whole new level of complexity, right? Because there's not only do you have to deal with what's in the room, but you have to deal with what's in the other rooms that you're connecting to, right? Um, and you've got microphones and speakers and feedback, things to worry about and all of that. Um, you can set up a video conferencing room to have six different speakers with pan tilt zoom controls for each one of the six different speakers. Cameras with pan tilt zoom controls on all six cameras in the room. That would provide the choice to get 
essentially every single human in the room on camera from every single point of view. Does that really improve the user's experience? No, it just makes it more complex for them. So we need to make sure that we're providing the level of choices to the users that they need to get what, done what they need to do, but not making it um, so that they have too many choices. Okay, so now it's back to you guys again. More ideas for strategies for dealing with managing simplicity and complexity in our classrooms. It's okay, I can do awkward silence, it's all right. <laughs> television to Add television to More complexity. How, how would you deal with that? So you deal with it by providing a technician to provide support. Mm -hmm. Someone over here. So dealing with not just solving the symptom, right, users that have to have a VHS player in the room, but thinking about how can we get that content converted ahead of time so that they never have that problem in the first place. That's a, uh, I, I have yet another mantra about when help desk tickets come in, we don't just try to solve the ticket as fast as we can, close it and forget about it. We look at those and say, okay, what can we do to have prevent that ticket from ever happening again? Um, same kind of thing. Do you have one? So he, he was saying that standardization is a great concept by itself, but you need to document your standard designs and your approaches too so that you can communicate those to architects and contractors that may be building or renovating facilities that you have. I think that's, that's a great point. Um, at, at UF we have, um, we had a standards document that I put together in like, I don't know, 1998 or something and it kind of sat around for a really long time and I just updated it. Um, a year or two ago um, with a lot of those same kind of issues. And the reason that I didn't update it for so long is because, well, we weren't building that many new classrooms, but also um, I felt like it was a little bit too complex for me to actually put down all of my ideas on paper. And I think that was probably a limitation that I should have tried harder to overcome to get to, to do what you suggest and then get all of those ideas um, on paper. Um, Designing functional classrooms is not the same thing as designing functional uh, telecommunications closets. Um, there's an uh, interplay of changing pedagogies, um, changing usages, uh, and, and physical requirements, architectural concerns, and aesthetic concerns that we don't, that are very difficult to do in standards. So it, it really takes a lot of effort to do that. Yes? So getting buy-in from all of the parties that are involved in renovation pro projects uh, by um, hopefully getting invited to the original design meetings. Uh, how many of you have gotten to that situation where you're like, okay, the building's just about finished. Can you put some AV in it for us? I hate that. <laughs> But you're right, getting buy-in from everybody, including the architects, facilities, planners, project managers, all of those people that are involved in the process, really critical. And it, it even goes down to the construction foreman that's on site. 
making sure that he understands as best you can what the issues are that he's having to deal with. Yes, sir. So, so, so the issue there is making sure um, that if, if we can get a lot of these concepts documented and communicated um, to the people that are involved, especially if we have an outside contractor integrator that's designing things, how many of us have seen oversell from contract, from, from integrators? Happens all the time. Because why? Because, you know, it's in their business to make money. That's why they're there. I don't begrudge them that, but we have to manage that. Um, and we manage it through communication and defining our needs. Five minutes. Other strategies? Okay, I'm starting to run out of time. Here's a quote that I found that was attributed to Steve Jobs. Can't verify its truth, because but the internet said it, so I assume it is. Simplicity is hard to do. Um, it's hard to make things simple. It's easy to make things complex. Um, and that's one of the things that I think is really important for us to work, focus on, um, is really designing for simple. Um, designing for complex can lead us into overly expensive solutions, and it can lead us into solutions that aren't supportable, aren't sustainable over time. So, what's the answer to our question? Can the KISS principle really survive in the digital classroom age? People that think it can, raise your hand. All right, good, I like it. This was not a wasted 40 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I think it can. Um, is it as simple? Is, is our situation as simple as we'd like it to be? No. Um, are there things that are more complex for our users and for our technicians than we'd like it to be? Yes. Um, but I think the idea, keeping that focus over time, can lead us uh, into the best scenario that we can expect, given the technological and other realities that we have to deal with. So that's my presentation. Thank you very much. I'm going to turn it over to Bruce. Thank you very much, Mark. Mm -hmm. Our next presenter, Bruce Ritchie.